Welcome to The Selling Show, where we unpack, repack, and break down exactly how top experts sell their ideas, their value, and their services. This is your host, David Newman, and you are in the right place if you want better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. wants to listen to another boring podcast? I don't know. Not me, not you, and not my amazing guest, Gail Casper. So we're going to have some fun. Gail, welcome to the show. Oh, David, it's so great to be here. I'm so excited about this. So excited. So I'm just going to read a couple of highlights from your website, just in case people are not familiar with the Gail Casper empire. Gail has reached millions of people through hundreds of national television, digital, and print media outlets, sharing her time-tested strategies with audiences all over the world. And locally, because of course many folks know that I live here in the city of brotherly love, aka the cradle of liberty, aka Philadelphia, she is the face of Philadelphia and the host of Philly Vision and their franchises. Gail has greeted over 40 million people as they pass through Philadelphia International Airport and the city's many hotels. She's in elevators. She's in lobbies. This woman is everywhere. And she's also the host of her own late night show called Raw Reality, which she developed from concept to broadcast. And she's up to so many cool things. Some are sales related. Some are business related. Some are leadership related. Some are health and wellness related. We got to talk about the whole empire. So, Gail, how did Gail Casper become Gail Casper. Give us the the backstory and some of the fun professional adventures along the way. Yeah, I started like everybody else in the business world. I actually dropped out of college. I was going to be a newscaster, dropped out because I changed majors. So I thought I was going to fail. And I ended up just being in the business world. I started as a secretary. So I really didn't know what I was doing. I was very stuck in life and I was living everyone else's dream. Hard worker, Got a lot of fulfillment from that, but living everybody else's dream. And it wasn't until I was about 30 years old when I was so sad and so depressed and in an abusive relationship, bad relationship, bad space, that I said, I have to change my life. And, you know, somebody had said to me, you need to start to get out. Something I really had never done. People think I'm a party animal, David. I, (laughs) but I am not. So it was a whole new learning experience for me to get out into the world, take classes, learn my skills, what I was good at. And that led me to really fall in love with helping people achieve. So when I did that, I then became a motivational speaker, worked inside a company. And within a year, I was out on my own. And to get out on my own, by the way, I had to get fired. So I know there's a whole bunch of questions in there you probably have for me, but that's been the road. I've been on my own you know, since then. Tell us about the adventures in broadcasting. How, what kind of brought you into that world? As I mentioned, I wanted to be a newscaster. When I started college, I dropped out of school thinking I was going to fail. I spent about five years in California, still stayed in the business world when I got back to Philadelphia. And when I was working for a training organization, we had a cold call. One of the companies was called America's TV Job Network. And I went in the door to sell them speaking programs. And they're like, you know, we're not looking for speakers, Gail. We're looking for hosts for a TV show. And even though I had never done it before, I said, what about me? And of course, that sounds ridiculous. And it was, but I couldn't let it go because they said, of course, we're looking for someone with experience. But I basically sat on their doorstep for three months until they hired me. So that gave me my first entrance into the TV world, which led to Philly Vision and Fairy Vision and my own late night show and bringing those skills as a guest onto national programs with my books. Amazing. And you also have kind of a deep expertise in selling and persuasion and, you know, personal, personal influence. Tell us a little bit about, and we'll obviously talk about sell like a cockatoo, which is kind of a fun concept. I want to dig into all of that and what that means and how cockatoos do such a good job with selling. But you've got products out there. You've got stuff on prospecting. You've got stuff out there on digital media to attract new clients. Tell us about the hybrid of you know where the sales aspect of your work came from. And then let's talk about the book. Yeah. And it all started really 
well, obviously I worked within training organizations to understand learning the selling process, took classes, courses to further develop that. But I've also taken an extensive body language classes and interrogation classes to understand the human spirit. So my organization really does focus on communications training. So I'm dealing with you one-on-one. I'm a sales rep. I want to bring my presentation up a level. I'm an executive. I want to appeal to a group and make sure they not only understand my message, but like me, or I just want to be in front of a camera. How do I connect with people if I'm in front of a camera? So all the things I've done have been directly related to communications, which I then developed sales training programs, which I brought into some of the leading organizations in the world, like ADT, Security Services, Steel Dynamics, which is a multi-billion dollar organization, and brought my program into them. And then just further develop that because we're in a technology world. Somebody walks in the door. It's a very transparent world now. People do the research before they walk in the door. They know your product. They know the price. How do you outsell your competition? So that's where Sell Like a Cockatoo comes in. So it has been a step-by-step process to get to where we are today. And as you know, it's constantly making those adjustments, meaning the world doesn't stand still. The same program or relationship selling that was years ago needs to be adjusted. It needs to be modified, but not changed completely. And I don't know how you feel about that, but I still think it's human to human. We have to have that questioning piece of the process. We need to understand people I think more than we ever have before, because technology has been in the way of really getting to that understanding. So that's kind of been the evolution of of getting from you know one space in the beginning to selling and selling a cockatoo. Well, it's funny. I'm curious, just coming out of the kind of pandemic era for the last two and a half years, and now looking forward to who knows what in 2023, recession, inflation, meltdown. I think selling always has to flex, right? And it's really based on exactly what you're saying, empathy and relevance. So when you say human to human, my fancy word for that is empathy, that we really need to know what's important to our prospect. And the only way to find out is to ask. You can't guess, you can't assume, you can't put words in their mouth. Talk a little bit about some of the, the advanced techniques, and maybe even just around questioning, if you want to start there around sell like a cockatoo so that we can take control of the sales sales conversation and really find out what we need to find out. Well, look at it this way. Somebody walks in the door and a simple question like, how was the drive here? In everybody's mind, it's like, oh, it was great. It was fine. It was long. I had to come from work. Well, whatever someone tells you, I had to drop my kids off. Okay. Now we know they have kids. We have to be attentive to every single thing they say. Well, I just came from work and wanted to say, oh, wow, like get a sense of how much they work. Is that their priority in life? What is important to them? If they just drop the kids off, well, what's going on with that? What are the ages of the kids? Who are they? Okay, you just drop them off and it's the middle of the day. All of these things should register in our head so that we can take that conversation a little bit deeper before we even get into selling. And I call that like digging deep. Because we're kind of doing it without them knowing about it, but our attention span and our attentiveness to that customer is much higher. It's not just a question. I mean, think about the sales process. When we learn it, and I attribute it to this, I was in a training organization when I first started training, and they gave me the training program, and they said, here are your steps, and this is what you have to do. At the beginning, at the end of class, these are your steps. Well, I did the steps, but I didn't fully understand the steps. So if they were like, okay, we start the class off with everybody shaking each other's hand and saying hello, I didn't understand what that meant. I just did it. And it's the same with the sales process or anything that we learn. We do it, we follow the steps, but we don't really absorb it. Yeah. I didn't understand that training program until I had to write my own. And so what I'm doing with Sell Like a Cockatoo is saying, let's put you deep into the process here. I've done the work for you. So that you can now take your mind and your brain to a different level to better understand that customer and who they are. Think about the iPhone. It does everything in life. It's the same thing. What do you like about it? What are your favorite aspects of that iPhone? Because that tells me a little bit about who you are, if I know that. It's like doing detective work, right? There's a detective show, and I wish I remembered what it was, but it's an apocryphal story. A detective is doing a stakeout. And the lieutenant says, well, how's it going on the stakeout? And it turns out that he missed a critical meeting or they weren't paying attention. They didn't know who he was meeting with. 
the lieutenant loses it. He says, listen, when you're doing a stakeout, I want to know minute by minute where he is, what he's doing, who he's meeting with. I want you to find out how he likes his eggs. And that's the punchline. It's like, we need to know how our prospects like their eggs. So yes, of course, it's about their family. It's about what does this solving this problem or getting this outcome, which means buying from you, what does it mean to them personally, professionally, financially, right? Scrambled, sunny side up. You want an omelet? What'd you order at the diner? I need to know how you like your eggs so I can sell to you for your reasons and not mine. That's exactly right. And you got back to this in the beginning. It's genuinely caring. It's that care level. You can't not care today. You have to care. You want to outshine your competition, then give a crap. That's what it boils down to. Give a crap. It's not just somebody walking in the door. It's not you had a tough night last night. You need to get started at 9 a.m. You need to be, okay, the customer's walking in. It's them, not you. Put you aside. Because if you don't give a crap, you don't deserve the sale. Because that's what sales really, it's not even selling, David. It's not. It's I care about you. I want to make the best invest. I want you to make the best investment for you. You're not selling your product to them. It's what they need and what's important to them. And if you believe 1000% in you and your product and your company, then why would they say no? That's why when we get to objections, it's kind of like, well, it's not really an objection. If you believe in what it is you're doing, you're just answering their questions. You're getting them to that close. You got to care. You got to care today. Are you loving this interview as much as I am? Holy smokes. Hey, you know what this reminds me of? There's a fantastic sales book that you got to get your hands on right here, right now. It's called Do It Selling. How do I know it's great? Well, I wrote it and you need to read it. Pop over right now to doitselling.com. Now back to our interview. Tell us about the cockatoo metaphor. What's special about that bird? How does that relate to the the book? It's like people say that to me. They're like, yeah, where the heck did a cockatoo come from, right? Well, let's look at some of the qualities of a cockatoo. Cockatoos are loud. You know, I have never met a sales rep that isn't excited, but has worked so hard to get that sale that is excited about the sale or gets frustrated about the rejection or rings that bell in a sales office. So they're loud. They need consistency. You can't leave a cockatoo alone and not be consistent with them. And it's the same with the sales rep. They need to be held accountable for what they're doing and the calls they make and the meetings that they have and reaching out to customers. And they don't like to be bored. Again, sales reps are smart. Challenge them, train them. Don't let them sit. Don't let them play on their phones or just go out and be grabbing food all the time. Make sure that they are invested and involved. And one of the biggest things is they dance. So when I talk to you about moving and changing, understanding the customer's body language, understanding your own body language, are you raising the value of that sales call just by how you portray you, just by how you sound in your tone of voice? So within Sell Like a Cockatoo, it goes through over 50 body language techniques. It goes through over 30 tone of voice techniques so that people can make those adjustments with the customer to move them toward that close. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Tell us about the voice techniques, because that's really interesting. Obviously, with your broadcast experience, and I have a theater background, which we're not going to get into because it was crazy town. Oh, my God. That's going to have to be another people time. Always ask, because I want to hear they, that. <laughs> they say, David, have you had voice lessons? And I'm like, no. Well, you must have this from like your theater background. No, because in theater, I was a director. I wasn't an actor. I mean, it's very important, right, that we use our voice the right way because it's the vehicle that shows the concern, the curiosity, the empathy, the caring. Tell us about the some of the voice techniques and why they're important. All right, so here you go. It is a combination of body language and tone of voice. It's both because you can do things with body language that express interest just by leaning forward and being invested. Or if you're standing sideways when the customer is standing there, believe it or not, you want to always be straight on with the customer. If you're standing sideways, it's an indication that you're kind of like already moving on to something else. So you want to be facing the customer straight on. When it comes to our tone of voice and And one of the things I've said to you when we first talked before we even got live here is, you know, I love your energy. I love your enthusiasm that you bring to the show. It makes the difference because you're invested in every single one of your guests and what it is they're going to bring. It's the same with the customer. Are you genuinely interested and excited to meet them? 
Do you genuinely care when they're telling you a story and what's going on with their life or what might be holding them back? Are you able to change your tone of voice? My high-level coaching program takes somebody that might speak more monotone or isn't sure what they're doing with their voice, and it helps them to change those things so that they can connect with the customer. So I will actually take somebody, if I need to, break them down so that I can then build them back up again. And the other element of that is to sometimes somebody asks you a question, you're uncertain of the answer. How do you handle that? Well, you don't want to change your tone. You want to make sure you keep that lower pitch voice. We have a tendency to raise our voice up if we're uncertain how to answer something, which is really critical when we're dealing with the objection phase. Yeah. So that's just a couple of things that are in there. (laughs) I love that. I love that so much. I'm just going to change gears here a little bit because you also have this systematic attitude development technique. Is that S-A-D-T? Is that what we call it? Yes, sad T. Sad Sad T. T. So sad T is going to make a lot of people glad. Tell us what that is and how that works. When I was stuck in life, what I found that taking action, taking those first steps, making a little bit of motion always made me feel better. Think about when you wake up in the morning and you say to yourself, you know what? I don't feel like going to the gym today. You planned on it, but I don't feel like it. We've all been there before. We just don't feel like it. That's an emotional response. Logically, if you're like, okay, I'm getting up, I'm going to the gym, what ends up happening is we end up having a great day. And we say to ourselves later, oh my God, I'm so glad I went. Now, the sad tea is representative of that. It's such a simple process where you identify what are the steps I need to have or do in a day to be successful and then prioritize those steps, and then do the top three things that would produce the greatest results in your life. Because if you're in a negative space, especially as a sales rep, what are the things that are going to produce the greatest amount of financial return in your day? Sometimes those are the things you do not want to do, but to do them and take those steps will produce results in your life and make you feel like, man, I had a good day today. I got something done. So sad tea is about getting logical in the face of emotion. and. Ultimately, that's what brings us results. Emotion gets in the way of moving forward. Oh, for sure. Big time. So this is baked into all of your various training and coaching programs? That's a great way to say it, David. It is baked in, meaning that whether I am giving them the steps so that they're able to move forward, and sometimes in my training programs, which is actually the majority of my training programs, They're long-term. They might be four to six weeks long, which means that I'm in a spot to say, here's your homework. If you get emotional that first week and you don't do that homework, I come back the next week. So you feel compelled to either get something done or we're going to get something done together when I see you the next time with the objective of trying things out. Screw up. Who cares? I'm coming back to help you fix it. But it's a step-by-step process to keep people going. Now, I know that in one of your videos, and if, by the way, fantastic website, lots of videos, lots of resources, and we're going to send Thank people you. some things at the end. You have B-roll of all these products that you've created over the years. And I think some of them, I'm, I don't want to date anybody here, but some of them might be like CDs or DVDs. Is that correct? Well, they used to be. Now they my books, my audios, yeah, my audios are available for download. Their audio books available, Hashay Publishing and also Apple Books. So you can nice. download them. Yeah, yeah, you can download them at this Very point. Very cool. Which is awesome. So talk yeah. about your adventures in sort of productizing, because I know a lot of folks listening like, man, I wish I had like a, a training program or a streaming something or something that people could like buy, download, and use both as an entry point to a coaching or consulting relationship, but also as a profit center. So how, how did you get started productizing? Yeah, you know, and it's tough. We talk about logic and emotion. When you think about, oh my God, I want to get a product out there. It's so big. That's an emotional reaction. Right. You have to look at it in little pieces. So you want to break it down for yourself so that you are in a spot to do, okay, I'm just going to sit, I'm going to write for half an hour, an hour. And then I'm going to follow up and write half hour, an hour again. But you are literally setting that time aside so that you are in a spot to make progress on getting that project done. You don't want to just say, okay, I'm going to spend a whole day tomorrow working on it because the chances that that's going to happen are slim and none, and then you're not going to do anything. So the first thing I would say in that process is set the time aside, small pieces. 
to put your outline together and decide what that product is going to be. And what is the need? Who are you appealing to? Who's your audience? Not to just put anything together, but who's the audience? What are the problems? What are you trying to solve? And then write. And then once you do that, you have a decision to make because mostly everything is online today. So again, you want people to have access to classes and courses, but also have a downloadable book. To write a physical book today, I am a big believer in doing that no matter what. I love the idea of the digital world. I do believe in saving the trees. So if we don't have it, you know, we're not using as much paper. It's not a bad thing, but I love the idea of taking it full circle and having a physical book out there as well. But don't overwhelm yourself. That's the first thing I would say to people because I've done a lot of products and it's huge. It's really, it's a big undertaking and it can stop you. Yes. Do it in little pieces. Yes. Now it's funny because obviously as a seasoned speaker, there are folks that are listening to us and they go, you know, Gail, I've heard the advice that I first have to write a book before I get on any stage and no one's going to want a speaker who has not written a book. In your experience, and obviously with your clients and your audiences, is that a stone cold requirement? I personally don't think so, but I'm, I'm open to a healthy debate on this. Do you have to write a book before you are a viable paid speaker? I'm not going to be able to debate you. I'm going to have to tell you that because I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm going to get back to value. I'm going to get back to value. Value of you. What are you bringing? Are you trained and skilled? Again, one of my coaching sessions is about public speaking. I'm a communications expert. So are you prepared to get up on your feet? This past year, I got two TEDx talks, which was, I've always wanted to do it, but to be given two when you're up against 1,500 applicants each time is huge. And I'm honored for that. But the amount of preparation and time and effort that goes into it, you can't take it lightly. So are you ready to do those things? Do you have an outline of the course that you want to speak on or the, you know, the speech that you want to do? Are you prepared to get up on your feet? Are you prepared to give it the time and, and practice? Because organizations can see value right away. And that's what you're selling. You're selling you. Do you need to have books? They're a great compliment. I always suggest working on them if you don't have anything. But is it necessary? I agree with you. And the answer is no, you don't. Raise the value of you. Yes, 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 yes. That's really super important. Because I think some people, they have this do-it-yourself mentality. And they think, I'm just going to go gather a whole bunch of information. Gail, this all sounds great. I'm going to go to the bookstore. I'm going to go to the library. I'm going to take out the public speaking books. I'm going to take out the sales books. And my firm belief is that information is not going to cut it. You go to Barnes & Noble and you go to like the finance section. And there's a zillion books on how to get rich and how to manage your money. If it was all about information, we'd all be rich and we'd all know exactly how to manage our money. Then you go to the weight loss section. Then you go to the diet and fitness section. There's a zillion books. Here it is in four words, my friends. Eat less, move more. That's the information you need. Now go. You need mentors. You need guides. You need people like Gail to say, listen, here's how it works. Here's the structure. Here's the accountability. Here's the mentorship that will get you there much faster, much sooner, and much safer. Yeah. Talk about you know why are people resistant sometimes to invest thinking information is enough, I'll just go read a book. Sometimes people don't know, David. They really don't know any better. It's not until they're exposed to a teacher or a podcast like you have where they're like, huh, I didn't think of that before. That's good advice. There's such a thing as consciously competent. I don't know if you've heard of that before in the leadership world, where you just think, okay, I got it. I'm good. I don't need anything more. That is the one place that top organizations, top tiered sales reps, they never get to consciously competent because they are unconsciously competent. They are always working toward improvement. So if you want to stop your career, if you want to stop your business from growing, then get into consciously competent because you won't go anywhere. Anyone that wants to be anybody had to start and say, okay, what can we do better? How can we be better? Even Tony Robbins, you're seeing him come out with new programs, new discoveries. Grant Cardone, same thing, new discoveries. Like they're constantly evolving and multi million, multi billionaires, they have not stopped doing that. So the power of having that mentor and coach can save you years of time and falling down and 
failure when you could have had somebody that helped support you and get you there a lot quicker. Yes, 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 yes. You know, it's funny, Gail, this reminds me of a story. So we're both in the Philadelphia area. And so this is a Vanguard story. So right, Vanguard headquarters is about, you know, 15 miles out in the suburbs here in Malvern. I was talking to an executive at, this was like years and years ago, back when I was doing more corporate work. And she says to me, David, our problem is that, because she was managing this specific group, our problem is a lot of these guys are hot shots and they think they know it all. And they'll work on a fund and the fund within weeks has a hundred million dollars in it and they think they've won. And this goes back to your conscious competence, unconscious yep, competence. Yep. I basically finish her next sentence. And I say, but she just said they filled the fund with a hundred right. million dollars. What I finish the sentence with, and you think maybe it could have been 200. And she says, wow. exactly. That they wow. think that they're, you know, they're top gun, you know, big macho egos. And, and, you know, they're the ones that come home with like the prize. It's like, dude, we got to raise the game. You, know, you think you're successful. You are not seeing the next level of success because they have blinders on. And then, of course, highly successful people, if they don't do what you and I just talked about, then what creeps in is arrogance and complacency. I know it all. I don't need help. I'm good. I got this. And real world champions in any arena never say, I'm good. I got this. Exactly. And they're on top of that, I'm just going to add to what you said, because I agree with all of those things, is there's a sense of no peace, meaning that I, if I'm not working to be better and I just think I'm always at the top, then I'm never going to get to peace within myself. I'm never going to feel settled. There's always going to be something missing. I'm always going to think, well, if I make more money and if I just keep pushing in the job, then I'll find peace. But when you get to arrogance and you know you don't need to do anything more in life, there's no peace in that. So it's the humility, it's being humble, it's the growth that brings that ultimate peace in you. Holy smoke, so much value in this episode. Listen, if you are loving what you're hearing, feel free to download, subscribe, tell a friend, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to The Selling Show. Now, back to the interview. I remember this is so funny because, you know, so many of these stories kind of pop up and I'm sure that you have some too (laughs) with your clients. I had a guy call me up. He was a NBA basketball star for 15 years and he was starting his speaking career. And I sort of lay out, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, the strategy, the marketing, the messaging, the positioning, the outreach, the prospecting, the whole sales process. He says to me, literally, this is a quote, David, that sounds like a lot of work. I spent 15 years in the NBA. I've done my work. And I was like, whoa, dude, what kind of arrogant attitude is that? I spent 15 years in the NBA. I've done my work. This part needs to be easy, right? This part, I need to snap my fingers and get the $20,000 keynote. It's like, no, that's not how I wish it worked that way. You know, I love you for your entrepreneurial wish that it worked that way. But just like you worked your ass off in the NBA, you got to work your ass off in the speaking business. And if he did, because he has that clout in the NBA, so if you put that equal effort into getting that, you know, well-rounded, oh my God, yeah. he'd be called in from location to location to location. Yeah. But you got, you're right. You got to put that upfront effort in. It's a whole new world. You can't, it doesn't transfer. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. transfer. Let's also talk a little bit about talking to buyers who may be distracted and freaking out. So obviously, March of 2020, we had the whole COVID world crash down on our heads. Buyers weren't buying. Meetings, conferences, training, everything was canceled. Consulting agreements were torn up. Coaching programs were put on freeze from these big companies. And so now we're entering this sort of economic uncertainty, right? It's kind of economic virus, if you will. Companies are doing hiring freezes. Companies are saying, hey, Gail, we'd love to bring you in. We can't bring you in. We just laid off 10% of our people. It wouldn't look good. We have spending freezes. We have spending cuts. They're distracted and they're scared. How do you talk to a prospect selling anything? But how, how do you talk to a prospect that is distracted and is scared? And the actual reality 
is they probably need you now more than they more did than before, ever. but they're freaking out. And that's where our presentation needs to be molded. Meaning, what is the return on investment that you're going to give somebody? It can't be abstract. It's got to be, okay, they will gain these specific tools or this specific information that will then help them do X, Y, or Z. And you have to be in a spot, which is what we just talked about, that ourselves as consultants or whoever it is that's selling, we have to be in a spot that we raise the bar with regard to our performance. We've got to do double time today. It's not the same okay, well, I've got one appointment this, I've got a couple appointments this week. We've got to double up on those and find creative ways to sell, not just the same old, same old. Because if we're doing things the same old, same old with people that are scared, we've got to talk them off of the ledge first before we can even open their mind to what's possible. And maybe we start on a smaller scale that says, hey, look, I just want to introduce what I have right now and then let's ramp it up. But yes. do something. Companies don't stand still because that's what they're saying they want to do. I want to stand still right now because I'm too afraid to move. I worked with the president of an organization when the economy was crashing, like 2008, 2009. He didn't lower his prices. He raised them. And Amen. It, he was a phenomenal president. He's like, I'm not afraid of this. He would go to conferences. He wasn't afraid to share his work and processes with the competition at these conferences. He said, that's okay. You know, Jane, you're the COO, do a talk. He was not afraid of it. If we are afraid of what's happening around us, then we haven't fully developed who we are and we aren't competent in our own processes. That's what it boils down to. Yes. So good. In the last crisis, again, 2007, 2008, one of my favorite sayings was, listen, you can either be scared or you can be shared. It's like, right, do you want to be referred? Do you want to be known as the superhero? Do you want to be known as the protector and the savior of your target market? It's like, oh my gosh, thank God Gail is here. Gail's going to help us. We're in this terrible spot right now. Gail is here to make it better. So do you want to be scared and not go to the marketplace? Or do you want to be shared and your content and your books and your coaching and your keynotes and all of that? People are saying now more than ever, we need Gail Casper. Yeah. And what we're talking about here is it's ironic. It leads us right back to square one, the systematic attitude development technique. Everybody's in emotion right now. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Everybody's in emotion. We're saying, let's get back to logic here. Let's get back to what are the steps that we have to take? And I'll work with you however I can. If it has to be small steps, that's okay. But we got to get back into a groove and routine and stay focused on the end goal because we've lost that focus. All of a sudden we're knocked down. It's like, oh my God, what do we do? So I'm with you, David. I'm completely with you. It's so funny. The moment you say we have to get back to logic, sometimes a client in times of uncertainty, they want to buy, they're leaning in, they're ready to go. And they will say something like, well, Gail, I'm ready to make a leap of faith. And imagine if we said, okay, Barbara, that's great, but I'm not even asking you to make a leap of faith. I'm asking you to make a leap of logic, right? Imagine that pattern interrupt like, oh, okay. So this is not a leap of faith. This is a leap of logic. Buying from you is a leap of logic because you know that this person can help solve your problem. Absolutely. I'm with you on that. And that's exactly what it is. But here's the deal. The person that's selling, you, me, someone else, cannot be in that emotional space. Like, oh my God. Because then we are not doing the best or bringing the best that we can bring. We're just trying to scramble to figure out how to close a deal. And that doesn't work. Totally. I think all things are possible if your mindset doesn't weaken. Yep. I'm with you. Absolutely. Totally. Well, I've got two final questions for you as we start to land the plane here. The final, final question is how can people get connected and stay connected to more Gail Casper Brilliance? And we'll talk about the new book, Selling Like a Cockatoo. We'll talk about some other resources and how to get connected to your world. Before we get to that, though, my second to last question, if folks were to take one overarching concept from our whole conversation today about the state of sales and selling and influence and being a person of value in the marketplace, what do you hope that overarching takeaway concept would be? Redesign you, meaning back up. Look at all your strengths, the challenges that you have, the mentors you need to have in place, make that investment, and then take the steps to do it. 
so that you elevate the value of you so high in what you bring that it's indestructible. Totally love that. All right. How can people get connected and stay connected to more Gail Casper brilliance? We want links. We want resources. Where can we send people, Gail? First and foremost, gailcasper.com, and that's with the K. So like the ghost, but with a K. So it's G-A-I-L-K-A-S, as in Sam, Peace and Peter, E-R.com. You'll be able to subscribe to my newsletter. You'll be able to get Sell Like a Cockatoo, Unstoppable. They're all there. I also have selllikeacockatoo.com, which offers a free training. It's a 20-minute training that kind of gives you a couple inside tips about the book, some of the things we talked about here today. And you also have the ability to buy it there. So, but gailcasper.com, it gives you all the links to my social media, follow me, check me out. And certainly if you have questions, send me a note. I'd love to answer your questions as well. Tremendous. And all of those links are one click away directly under this episode at theSellingShow.com. Gail Casper, you are awesome. We could go on for weeks talking about sales and selling. (laughs) So what that means is we simply have to have you back. I would love, oh my gosh, I had such a great time. And I, I love your questions because I feel they're so necessary for people today to really grasp on to the steps they need to take to get to the next level in their own lives. So it's been a great time, David. I had a great time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll have to book our return engagement really soon. And that wraps up another episode of The Selling Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, tell a friend, go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thesellingshow.com. See you next time. 